Hi kids! So today we are going to start reading a book together as a class and the book is called The Watsons Go to Birmingham 1963 and it's by Christopher Paul Curtis. Now this story takes place back in the 60s, the 1960s. Uh, yes, I was born in 1962 so I can't tell you a whole lot about the 60s. I was pretty young but uh, I've learned things over time and the 60s were a time of dynamic change in our country. There was a lot of upheaval politically. Our country was involved in the Vietnam War. There was a lot of social change, a lot of change in music and clothing and fashion. And you might think about things like uh, hippies and really the, uh, the advent of rock and roll. But it was also a great time of social change when it came to racism and bigotry. Now, even though the Civil War had ended over a, almost a hundred years before this time, African Americans in this country did not always have the same rights or the same opportunities that white people did. And while this was especially true in the South, it was not just limited to the South. There was racism all over this country. In fact, today, we can still see that. But this is the story about a family, an African-American family. And we're going to learn about each member of the family, especially in this first chapter. And then we're going to learn about a journey that they go on to the southern part of the United States. Now, the beginning of this story starts in Flint, Michigan. And Michigan is a northern state. Uh, it has winters like we do, summers like we do. And Michigan is known for cars. They were uh, very big. A lot of uh, uh, car factories, rather, um, are found in Michigan. So every day we're going to read a chapter, and you're going to have a writing assignment. Um, you can either read independently, or if you wish to read along as I'm reading aloud, that's your option. So I'm going to get started here with Chapter 1 of The Watsons Go to Birmingham, 1963. And you wonder why we get called the Weird Watsons. It was one of those super-duper cold Saturdays, one of those days when you breathed out and your breath kind of hung frozen in the air like a hunk of smoke. And you could walk along and look exactly like a train blowing out big, fat, white puffs of smoke. It was so cold that if you were stupid enough to go outside with your eyes, your eyes would automatically blink a thousand times all by themselves. Probably so the juice inside of them wouldn't freeze up. It was so cold that if you spit, the slob would be an ice cube before it hit the ground. It was about a zillion degrees below zero. It was even cold inside our house. We put sweaters and hats and scarves and three pairs of socks on and still were cold. The thermostat was turned all the way up and the furnace was banging and sounding like it was about to blow up, but I, it still felt like Jack Frost had moved in with us. All of my family sat real close together on the couch under a blanket. Dad said this would generate a little heat. But he didn't have to tell us this. It seemed like the cold automatically made us want to get together and huddle up. My little sister, Joetta, sat in the middle. And all you could see were her eyes because she had a scarf wrapped around her head. I was next to her, and on the outside was my mother. Mama was the only one who wasn't born in Flint, so the cold was coldest to her. All you could see were her eyes, and they were shooting bad looks at Dad. She always blamed him for bringing her all the way from Alabama to Michigan, a state she called a giant icebox. Dad was bundled up on the other side of Joey, trying to look at anything but Mama. Next to Dad, standing with a little space between them, was my older brother, Byron. 
Byron had just turned 13, so he was officially a teenage juvenile delinquent and didn't think it was cool to touch anybody or let anybody touch him, even if it meant he froze to death. Byron had tucked a blanket between him and Dad down into the cushion of the couch to make sure he couldn't be touched. Dad turned on the TV to try to make us forget how cold we were, but all that did was get him in trouble. Excuse me, just going to get the lights on. I swear, whoever put that switch in, put it in the wrong spot. Now, I want you to think about who's telling this story. What's the point of view? I'm going to go back to the beginning of that chapter. Dad turned on the TV to try to make us forget how cold we were, but all that did was get him in trouble. There was a special news report on Channel 12 telling about how bad the weather was, and Dad groaned when the guy said, If you think it's cold now, wait until tonight. The temperature is expected to drop into record low territory, possibly reaching the negative 20s. In fact, we won't be seeing anything above zero for the next four to five days. He was smiling when he said this, but none of the Watson family thought it was funny. We all looked over at Dad. He just shook his head and pulled the blanket over his eyes. Then the guy on the TV said, Here's a little something we can use to brighten our spirits and give us something, some hope for the future. The temperature in Atlanta, Georgia is forecast to reach... Dad coughed real loud and jumped off the couch and turned the TV off, but we all heard the weathermen say, the mid-70s. The guy might as well have tied Dad to a tree and said, ready, aim, fire. Atlanta, Mama said. That's 150 miles from home. Willona, Dad said. I knew it, Mama said. I knew I should have listened to Moses Henderson. Who? I asked. Dad said, oh, Lord, not that sorry story. You got to let me tell about what happened with him. Mama said, there's not a whole lot to tell. Just a story about a young girl who made a bad choice. But if you do tell it, make sure you get all the facts right. We all huddled as close as we could get because we knew Dad was going to try to make us forget about being cold by cutting up. Me and Joey started smiling right away, and Byron tried to look cool and bored. Kids, Dad said, I almost wasn't your father. You guys came real close to having a clown for a daddy named Hambone Henderson. Daniel Watson, you stop right there. You're the only one who started that ham bone nonsense. Before you started that, everyone called him his Christian name, Moses. And he was a respectable boy, too. He wasn't a clown at all. But the name stuck, didn't it? Ham bone Henderson. Me and your granddaddy called him that because the boy had a head shaped just like a ham bone had more knots and bumps on his head than a dinosaur. So, as you guys sit here giving me these dirty looks because it's a little chilly outside, ask yourselves if you'd rather be a little cool or go through life being known as the ham bonettes. Now, me and Joey cracked up. Byron kind of chuckled, and Mama put her hand over her mouth. She did this whenever she was going to give a smile because she had a great big gap between her front teeth. If Mama thought something was funny, first you'd see her trying to keep her lips together and hide the gap. Then, if the smile got to be too strong, you'd see the gap for a hot second before Mama's hand would come up to cover it. Then, she'd crack up too. Laughing only encouraged Dad to cut up more, so when he saw the whole family thinking he was funny, he really started putting out a show. He stood up in front of the TV. Yep, Hambone Henderson proposed to your mother around the same time I did. He fought dirty, too. Told your mama a pack of lies about me, and when she didn't believe them, he told her a pack of lies about Flint. 
Dad started talking Southern style, imitating this ham bone guy. Willona, I hear tell about the weather that far north in Flint, Michigan. Heard it's colder than inside an icebox. Seen a movie about it. Think it was made in Flint. Movie called Nanook of the North. Yup, do you believe for sure it made in Flint? Uh-huh, Flint Mitch again. Folks up there live in these things called igloos. According to what I seen in here movie, most of the folks in Flint is Chinese. Don't believe I seen Nan one color person in the whole dang city. You a Bama gal. Don't believe you'd be too happy living in no igloo. Ain't got nothing against them. But don't believe you'd be too happy living amongst a whole slew of Chinese folks. Don't believe you'd like the food. Only thing then, Chinese in the movie, it was whales and seals. Don't believe you'd like no whale meat. Don't taste a lick like chicken. Don't taste like pork at all. Mama pulled her hand away from her mouth. Daniel Watson, you are a lying man. Only thing you said that was true was that being in Flint is like living in an igloo. I knew I should have listened to Moses. Maybe these babies might have been born with lumpy heads, but at least they'd have had a warm lumpy heads. You know, Birmingham is a good place, and I don't mean just the weather either. Life is slower. The people are friendlier. Oh, yeah, Dad interrupted. They're a laugh a minute down there. Let's see, where was that colored's only bathroom downtown? Daniel, you know what I mean. Things aren't perfect, but people are more honest about the way they feel. She took her eyes off Dad and put them on Byron. And folks there do know how to respect their parents. Byron rolled his eyes like he didn't care. All he did was tuck the blanket farther into the couch cushion. Dad didn't like the direction the conversation was going. So he called the landlord for the hundredth time. The phone was still busy. That snake in the grass has got his phone off the hook. Well, it's going to be too cold to stay here tonight. Let me call Cindy. She just had that new furnace put in. Maybe we can spend the night there. Aunt Cindy was kind of mean, but her house was always warm, so we kept our fingers crossed that she was home. Everyone, even Byron, cheered when Dad got Aunt Cindy, and she told us to hurry up over before we froze to death. Dad went out to try to get the brown bomber started. That was what we called our car. It was a 1948 Plymouth that had dull brown, that was dull brown and real big. Byron said it was turd brown. Uncle Bud gave it to Dad when it was 13 years old, and we'd had it for two years. Me and Dad took real good care of it, but some of the time it didn't like to start in the winter. After five minutes, Dame, Dad came back in huffing and puffing and slapping his arms across his chest. Well, it was touch and go for a while, but the great brown one pulled through again. Everyone cheered. But me and Byron quit cheering and started frowning right away. By the way, Dad smiled at us. We knew what was coming next. Dad pulled two ice scrapers out of his pocket and said, Okay, boys, let's get out there and knock those windows out. We moaned and groaned and put on more coats and went outside to scrape the car windows. I could tell by the way he was pouting that Byron was going to try to get out of doing his share of the work. I'm not going to do your part, Byron. You better do it, and I'm not playing either. Shut up, punk. I went over to the brown bomber's passenger side and started hacking away at the scabs of ice that was all over the windows. I finished Mama's window and took a break. Scraping ice off windows when it's that cold can kill you. I didn't hear any sound coming from the other side of the car, so I yelled out, I'm serious, Byron. I'm not doing that side, too. And if I'm only going to do half the windshield, I don't care what you do to me. 
The windshield on the bomber wasn't like the new 1963 cars. It had a big bar running down the middle of it, dividing it in half. Shut your mouth. I got something more important to do right now. I peeked around the back of the car to see why Bai, to see what Bai was up to. The only thing he'd scraped off was the outside mirror, and he was bending down to look at it himself in it. He saw me and said, You know what, Square? I must be adopted. There ain't no way two folks as ugly as your mama and daddy could give birth to someone as sharp as me. He was running his hands over his head like he was brushing his hair. I said, forget you, and went back to the other side of the car to finish the back window. I had half of the ice off when I had to stop again and catch my breath. I heard Byron mumbling my name. I said, you think I'm stupid? I'm not going to work this. It's not going to work this time. He mumbled my name. It sounded like his mouth was full of something. I knew this was a trick. I knew this was going to be a How to Survive Blizzard Part 2. How to Survive Blizzard Part 1 had been last night when I was outside playing in the snow and Byron and his running buddy, Buphead, came walking by. Buphead was offic had a officially been a juvenile delinquent even longer than Byron. Now, boys and girls, a juvenile delinquent simply means a young child, say teenager, that kind of breaks the law and just has a bad attitude about things. Anyway, back to the story. Say, kid, Bai said, you want to learn something that might save your life one day? I should have known better, but I was bored, and I think maybe the cold weather was making my brain slow, so I said, what's that? We're going to teach you how to survive a blizzard. How? Byron put his hands in front of his face and said, this is the most important thing to remember, okay? Why? Well, first, we got to show you what it feels like to be trapped in a blizzard. You ready? He whispered something to Buphead, and they both laughed. I'm ready. I should have known that the only reason Buphead and Bai would want to play with me was to do something mean. Okay, Bai said. The first thing you got to worry about is high winds. Byron and Buphead each grabbed one of my arms and one of my legs and swung me between them going, Woo, blizzard warnings, blizzard warnings, woo, take cover. Buphead counted to three, and on the third swing, they let me go in the air. I landed head first in a snowbank. But that was okay, because I had on um, three coats, two sweaters, a t-shirt, three pairs of pants, and four socks, along with a scarf and a hat and a hood. These guys couldn't have hurt me if they'd thrown me off the Empire State Building. After I climbed out of the snowbank, they started laughing, and so did I. Cool, baby bro, Bai said. You passed the part of the test with a B plus. What you think, Buphead? Buphead said, yeah, I give the little punk an A. They whispered some more and started laughing again. Okay, Bai said. Second thing you got to learn is how to keep your balance in high wind. You got to be good at this so you don't get blowed into no polar bear dens. They put me in between them and started making me spin around and around, and it seemed like they spun me for about a half hour. When slob started flying out my mouth, they let me stop, and I wobbled around before, for a while before they pushed me back in the same snowbank. When everything stopped going in circles, I got up and we all laughed again. They whispered more, and then Bai said, What you think, Buphead? He kept his balance a good long time. I'm going to give him an A-. minus. I ain't as hard a grader as you. I'm giving the little punk a double A-. minus. Okay, Kenny. Now, the last part of surviving a blizzard. You ready? Yup. You passed the wind test. You did real good on the balance test. But now we got to see 
if you're ready to graduate, you remember what we told you was the most important part about surviving? Yup. Okay, here we go. Buphead, tell him about the final exam. Buphead turned, around, turned me around to look at, at him, putting my back to Byron. Okay, Square, he started. I want to make sure you ready for this one. You done so good so far. I want to make sure you don't blow it at graduation time. You think you ready? I nodded, getting ready to be thrown in the snowbank real hard this time. I made up my mind I wasn't going to cry or anything. I made up my mind that no matter how hard they threw me in the snow, I was going to get up laughing. Okay, Buphead said. Everything's cool. You remember what your brother said about putting your hands up? Like this? I covered my face with my gloves. Yeah, that's it. Buphead looked over my shoulder at Byron and then said, Whoo, high winds blowing snow. Whoo, look out, blizzard are coming. Death around the corner. Look out. Byron mumbled my name and I turned around to see why his voice was sounded so funny. As soon as I looked at Byron, looked at him, Byron blasted me in the face with a mouthful of snow. Man, it was hard to believe how much stuff By could put in his mouth. Him and Bup had just about died laughing as I stood there with snow and spit and ice dripping off my face. Byron caught his breath and said, Oh man, you flunked. You done so good. Then you go and flunk the blowing snow section of how to survive a blizzard. You forgot to put your hands up. What you say, Buphead? F? Yeah, double F minus. It was a good thing my face was numb from the cold already, or I might have froze to death. I was too embarrassed about getting tricked to tell on them, so I went in the house and watched TV. So as me and Bye scraped the ice off the brown bomber, I wasn't going to get fooled again. I kept on chopping ice off the back window and ignoring Bai's mumbling voice. The next time I took a little rest, Byron was still calling my name, but sounded like he had something in his mouth. He was saying, Kee, Kee, help, help. When he started banging on the door of the car, I went to take a peek at what was going on. Bai was leaning over the outside mirror, looking at something in it real close. Big puffs of steam were coming out of the side of the mirror. I picked up a big, hard chunk of ice to get ready for Byron's trick. Kitty, kitty, help me, help me. Go get mama, go get, go get mama. Hurry, hurry up. I'm not playing, Byron. I'm not that stupid. You better start doing your side of the car or I'll tear you up with this ice ball. He banged his hand against the car harder and started stomping his feet. Oh, please, kitty, help me. Go, mama. I raised the ice chunk over my head. I'm not playing, by You better get busy or I'm telling Dad. I moved closer, and when I got right next to him, I could see boogers running out of his nose and tears running down his cheeks. These weren't tears from cold either. These were big, juicy, crybaby tears. I dropped the ice chunk. Bye. what's wrong? Help me, Kitty. Go get help. I moved closer. I couldn't believe my eyes. Byron's mouth was frozen on the mirror. He was as stuck as a fly on flypaper. I could have done a lot of stuff to him. If it had been me with my lips stuck on something like this, he'd have tortured me for a couple of days before he got help. Not me, though. I nearly broke my neck trying to get into the house to rescue Byron. As soon as I got through the front door, Mama, Daddy, and Joey all yelled, Close the door! Mama, quick! It's by! He's frozen up outside! No one seemed too impressed. I screamed, Really? He's frozen to the car! Help! He's crying! That shook them up. You could cut Byron's head off 
and he probably wouldn't cry. Kenneth Bernard Watson, what on earth are you talking about? Mama, please hurry up. Mama, Daddy, and Joey threw on some extra coats and followed me to the brown bomber. The fly was still stuck and buzzing. Oh, Mama, help me. Get me out of here. Oh, my Lord, Mama screamed, and I thought I thought she was, she was going to do one of those movie-style faints. She even put her hand over her forehead and staggered back a little bit. Joey, of course, started crying right along with Byron. Dad was doing his best not to explode laughing. Big puffs of smoke were coming out of his nose and mouth as he tried to squeeze his laughs down. Finally, he put his head on his arms and leaned against the car's hood and howled. Byron, Mama said, gently wiping tears off his cheeks with the end of her scarf. It's okay, sweetheart. How'd this happen? She sounded like she was going to be crying in a minute herself. Dad raised his head and said, Why are you asking how it happened? Can't you tell, Walona? This little knucklehead was kissing his reflection in the mirror and he got his lips stuck. Dad took a real deep breath. Is your tongue stuck too? No, quit teasing. Yay, help, help. Well, at least the boy had gotten too passionate with had, hadn't gotten too passionate with himself. Dad thought this was hilarious and put his head back in his arms. Mama didn't see anything funny. Daniel Watson, what are we gonna do? What do y'all do when this happens up here? Mama started talking Southern style when she got worried. Instead of saying here, she said here. And instead of saying you all, she said y'all. Dad stopped laughing long enough to say, Willona, I've lived in Flint all my life, 35 years, and I swear this is the first time I've ever seen anyone with their lips frozen to a mirror. Honey, I don't know what to do. Wait till he thaws out? Pull him off, Dad, I suggested. Byron went nuts. He started banging his hands on the brown bomber doors again and mumbling, No, no, Mama, no, no, let him. Joey blubbered out. This is just like that horrible story Kenny read me about the guy, Nary Sissy, who stared at himself so long he forgot to eat and starved to death. Mama, please save him. She went over and hugged her arms around stupid Byron's waist. Mama asked Dad, What about hot water? Couldn't we pour enough hot water on the mirror so it would warm up and we could get, he could get it off? She kept wiping tears off Bye's cheeks. Don't worry, baby. We're going to get you off this. But her voice was shaky and southern, and I wondered if we'd be driving around in the summer with the skeleton dangling from outside the mirror by its lips. Dad said, I don't know. Pouring water on him might be the worst thing to do, but it might be our only chance. Why don't you go get some hot tap water and I'll stay to wipe his cheeks? Joey told Bye, don't worry, we'll come right back. She stood on her tiptoes and gave Bye a kiss. Then she and Mama ran inside. Daddy cracked up all over again. Well, lover boy, I guess this means no one can call you hot lips, can they? Dad was killing himself. Or the last red hot lover either, huh? He tugged at Byron's ear a little, pulling his face back. Bye went nuts again. Don't do that. Mama, Mama, help. Can he go get Mama? Hurry. Hmm. I guess that's not going to work, is it? Every time he wiped away the tears and the little mustache of boogers on Byron's lip, Dad couldn't help laughing until a little river of tears was coming out of his eyes, too. Dad tried to straighten his face out when Mama and Joey came running back with a steaming glass of hot water, but the tears were still running down his cheeks. Mama tried to pour the water on the mirror, but her hands were shaking so much she was splashing it all over the place. Dad tried too, but 
He couldn't look at Byron without laughing and shaking. That meant I had to do it. I knew that if my lips were frozen on something and everybody was shaking too much to pour water on them, except for Byron, he'd do some real cruel stuff to me. He probably would have accidentally uh, splashed my eyes until they were frozen open or put water in my ears until I couldn't hear anything, but not me. I gently poured a little stream of water over the mirror. Dad was right. That was the worst thing we could do. The water made a cracking sound and froze solid as soon as it touched the mirror and Byron's lips. Maybe Bai's mouth was frozen, but his hands weren't, and he popped me right in the forehead hard. I hate to say it, but I started crying too. It's no wonder the neighbors called us the weird Watsons behind our back. There we were, all five of us standing around a car with the temperature about a million degrees below zero, and each and every one of us crying. Top! Top! I yelled. Daniel Watson, what are we going to do? Mama went nuts. You got to get this boy to the hospital. My baby is going to die. Dad tried to look serious real quick. Walona, how far do you think I'd get driving down the street with this little clown attached to the mirror? What am I supposed to do? Have him run beside the car all the way down to the emergency room? Mama looked real close at Vi's mouth, closed her eyes for a second like she was praying, and finally said, Daniel, you get in there and call the hospital and see what they say we should do. Joey and Kenny, go with your daddy. Dad and Joey went crying into the house. I stayed by the brown bomber. I figured Mama was clearing everybody out for something. Byron did, too, and looked at Mama in a real nervous way. Mama put a scarf around Byron's face and said, Sweetheart, you know we got to do something. I'm going to try to warm your face up a little. Just relax. Okay, Ma. You know I love you and wouldn't do anything to hurt you, right? <laughs> Get ready, kids. If Mama was trying to make Byron relax, she wasn't doing a real good job. All this talk about love and not getting hurt was making him real nervous. What are you going to do, huh? Do hurt me, King. Help. Mama moved the scarf away and put one hand on Byron's chin and the other on his forehead. No, help. Help me, kid. Help. Mama gave Byron's head a good hard snatch. And my eyes automatically shut. And my hands automatically flew up to cover my ears. And my mouth automatically flew open and screamed out, Yeah! I didn't see it, but I bet Byron's lips stretched a mile before they finally let go of that mirror. I bet his lips looked like a giant rubber band before they snapped away from that glass. I didn't hear it, but I bet Byron's lips made a sound like a giant piece of paper being ripped in half. When I opened my eyes, Byron was running to the house with his hands over his mouth and Mama following right behind him. I ran over to the mirror to see how much of Byron's mouth was still stuck there. The dirty dogs let Byron get away with not doing his share of the windows and I had to do the whole car myself. When we were finally going to Aunt Cindy's house, I decided to pay Byron back for punching me in the forehead and getting out of doing his part of the window scraping. Joey was sitting between us, so I felt kind of safe. I said to her loud, Joetta, guess what? I'm thinking about writing my own comic book. What about? Well... It's going to be about this real mean criminal who has a terrible accident that turns him into a superhero. Joey knew I was going to tease Byron, so she sat there looking like I should be careful what I said. Finally, I asked her, 
Do you want to know what I'm going to call this new superhero? What? I'm going to call him the Lipless Wonder. All he does is beat up superheroes smaller than him, and the only thing he's afraid of is a cold mirror. All the weird Watsons except Byron cracked up. Mama's hand even covered her mouth. I was the only one who saw Byron flip me the dirty finger sign and try to whisper without smearing all the Vaseline Mama had put on his lips. You wait, I'm going to kick your little behind. And then he made his eyes go crossed, which was his favorite way of teasing me. But I didn't care. I knew who had won this time. Go to the directions for your reading assignment for today.